constructed. That's a total air temperature probe up there. That obviously should be clear and unobstructed. And then I'm going to come in closer to the airplane. There's an equipment bay right here. It's called the forward equipment bay. So obviously if they're not working on something, that door should be secured. All right, there's an ICAST message and a light on the overhead panel if it's unlocked. All right, I'm going to approach the nose gear. Gear doors, good condition. Landing lights, runway turnoff lights, um, clean, not broken. <clears throat> These are your steering actuators. If there's a tow bar connected to this airplane, this lever has to be in that position and a pin drop through it. If you find it other than that, a tow bar connected and it's like this, I want you to raise holy hell about that. It's an unsafe condition, it should never happen. But unfortunately, occasionally it does. But I want you to be really forceful about either getting the tow bar off or get this pinned in the tow position, okay? In the normal position, if somebody turned on the hydraulics, uh, the center hydraulics in particular, and the tiller was displaced, any of this nose wheel would try to move. And it's either gonna move the tow bar like this and take somebody's legs off from under them or it's gonna snap something on the tow bar, which is the best scenario, and possibly even damage the nose gear, all right? So that's a big deal, okay? All right, um, you're just checking for general condition. If we're getting ready to fly this airplane, then obviously this gear pin ought to be removed. Okay? Okay, that needs to be removed. That is a maintenance function, correct? Yes, you should never have to sure. do it. All right, if you found it like that, then I would grab somebody. I would grab somebody and say, hey, you still got the gear pins in. Oh, so this is two more. That would be the toe position, all right? That's the normal position. All right? Um, there's two springs up there. They need to be there and not be broken, all right? That, those springs are what helps pull it into the down and lock position, all right? So if you have hydraulic power, it should be okay. But if you had to alternately ex extend the gear because you didn't have any hydraulic power, those springs are a big part of getting it to the down and lock position. So they need to be there. They need to be in good condition. All right, I'm going to show you or tell you about something and then you may have to rotate through to see it. <clears throat> On the ceiling of this wheel well, there's an arm that's uh, shaped like a half circle, okay? So there's a, a metal plate right here that when the gear is up, that plate is touching that roller. That's how the gear is extended alternately. If I lose center hydraulic pressure, that arm rotates with an electric motor and it just pushes the nose gear out of the over center position and it free falls out. Okay? So, oops. So up on the ceiling is the arm of the roller and right at the end of uh, the pivot point of this bar right here, there's a little plate. And that plate rests up against the roller with the gear up. So take a quick look. nitrogen precharge or some of it anyway and it needs to, see to be chrome on the strips. Yeah, that chrome spot on. That much chrome right there. So I have to have some amount, which is several things. There's a uh, switch to turn on a wheel well light. So if I'm doing this at nighttime, I can turn on the light in the wheel well and I can see the things I'm looking for. All right, by the way, nighttime, you gotta have a flashlight. That thing, in your hand, that doesn't count as a flashlight. <laughs> okay, <laughs> gotta have a real flashlight. Hey, Steve. Yes, sir. All right, guys. There are twelve. She's this panel has a horn. All right. So if you call the ground crew, you have a button on your uh, uh, ACP audio control panel. All right. You push that. This horn goes off. They know that plug in and talk to you. Okay. If the APU catches on fire, this horn goes off. If you did a shutdown uh, flow and you did it poorly, 
and the IRSs are still on, but there's no power in the airplane, this horn goes off, all right? So the last few moments that you're in the airplane, if you're securing it, you'll hear this horn and you'll look at each other and go, what the hell is that noise? <laughs> it means your IRSs are still in them. They're on battery power, okay? So it means you screwed up. All right, if the APU catches on fire on the ground, with both fuel control switches off, so obviously we're doing our pre-flight, the AP will automatically shut down. It will not shoot the fire bottle if it needs to be fired. So it'll burn all Somebody is gonna to have to do that. Well, you guys remember the fire triangle? What, do I, what does it take to have a fire? You have to have fuel, heat, oxygen, have to have oxygen system. and fuel, right? If the AP shuts down, that may be the end of the source of the heat, all right, in the fire, may go away. But if it persists, then the fire bottle has to be fired. You can do it from here or the flight deck, obviously. So if maintenance is around, they hear the horn, they know to come down and push shut down, even though it probably already has shut down, but it arms the fire bottle. So as soon as you or maintenance pushes that shut down, this arm light comes on, and then I discharge the agent, and then the discharge light comes on, okay? So you can shut it down and arm the bottle from here? Correct, but if the horn's going off for a fire, it's probably already shut down or shutting down. So you're just gonna arm it at that point. Right, but I have to still hit shut down to arm the bottle. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. all right, but if the red light is on and the horn goes off, and you run over here to, sh to shoot the bottle, and the light and the horn goes away, you don't have to shoot the bottle, all right? It's like, probably a lot of people would do it anyway. That's what the right? fuel switch But if the fire on. signal goes away, that means shutting it down was enough, okay? So you're only in that protection with the fuel switches on, is that right? Say that again. What switches are on? <clears throat> the APU switch is in the run, uh, on position. That's it, yep. just out. Yeah. So anyway, if the fire, actually goes out, then you don't need to shoot the fire bottle, right? But probably a lot of people would be already wanting to armed to do it anyway. But <laughs> anyway, um, red light, horn, it's on fire. Light and the horn goes away, it's the fire is out, but I still have to go shut down, arm, discharge, discharge. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Yep. All right, so uh, if I saw this during my pre-flight, hmm, I go, I wonder why that's open. <laughs> All right, so that need to contact maintenance. Hey, why is this door open? This is the E and E compartment. Okay, so the majority of your avionics, radios, flight control computers. Um, let's see. Windshield heat transformers, uh, FMC, light management computers, all that stuff is in racks in there. And you can get to it from here and you can get to it from inside the airplane. There's a panel on the floor that a maintenance guy could pull up. So this is like the avionics bay? It is. Okay. That's where the majority of stuff. There's some of it up there in that forward bay where that little door is, but the majority of it is here. There's also one in the back but there's no easy access to it. Maintenance actually has to do a bunch of Zeus fasteners and remove a panel. And there's no indications for the one in the back. So a lot of the stuff that's back there is non-essential equipment. Non-essential from your point of view anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this will be a, something we would need to get maintenance on. All right, this is where your external power will be connected. All right, if there's no external power um, available and the APU is running, then we need to get this secured. Okay? All right, so if I step back a little bit, now I can see the pitot tubes and the angle of attack vein, uh, all that stuff on this side of the airplane. All right, so this is interesting. See that red decal that says emergency exit? Oh, yeah. All right, this airplane has an L1 door, doesn't have a right side door. And it has one, but it's deactivated, it doesn't work. So if you crash this airplane, and it ends up laying on the only door, then crash and ex rescue has to be able to gain access to the flight deck. Airplanes and they do the it they from there. Where it says push, pull, they push a button, a crank comes out, 
and they crank your window open to gain access to the plate. Huh. Okay? If it's if it's not already open, that probably means you're dead or incapacitated or something. Yeah. All right. Why do the RSDSM is it marked? Uh, on this airplane, it's not. Uh, no. On that airplane, around the area of the pedos, there's four right angle black marks. All right, and that's called the RBSM area. All it means is the skin inside of those four uh, right angles has to be in good condition. It can't be dented or wrinkled because it would disrupt the airflow potentially. All right, so it has to be clean in that area. Okay. And I assume this will probably get those marks at some point. Um, hmm. All right, so that green disc, your crew oxygen bottle or bottles, depending on the airplane, all right, is in the forward cargo compartment up against the uh, forward wall. All right, if that bottle is subjected to high temperatures, I think it's Boyle's law that says increase in temperature causes an increase in pressure. Well, there's a relief valve, so the bottle doesn't explode. Okay. That relief valve opens up and blows that disc out. So when you're doing your walk around, you go, hey, what happened to my disc? All right. So, so uh, maintenance has to go in and check the condition of the your crew oxygen system. Maybe it was overpressurized and relieved. Right. right. That, that black uh, probe, so is it ice detection? That's a temperature ice. probe. Yeah. All right, uh, it looks like it is for um, any ice. Oh, yeah, okay. Ice detection. Yeah, some of the airplanes have um, ice detection, some of them do not. Uh, Steve, do all 300s have winglets? No. Okay. I just want to make sure I didn't give you bad information. No. Some do, some don't. And I don't know if it's because it was the way they were ordered. Obviously, a winglet airplane probably is cheaper. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who has not done fires? All right. And 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 like I said, I'm... there's antennas all over the place. All right. I have TCAS antennas, GPWS antennas, VHF antennas, all kinds of things. So I'm looking at all these antennas, and they just need to be in good condition. Do we need to know all the antennas? No. Okay. No. You, you just need to know that they're in good condition. <laughs> Here's a uh, alternate yeah, static port. Uh -huh. um, it looks like it may have had a piece of tape on it yeah. for when it was in the wash rack or something, because it's a little different color uh -huh. there. But that needs to be clear and unobstructed, obviously. So if it had, I don't know why in the world a, a wash rack would use clear tape, but if it had some clear tape on it, at first glance it might look okay. Yeah, right. All right? But um, clear and unobstructed. Okay, cargo door, uh, probably there's loading when you do your pre-flight, but if loading is all done, all you have to do is look in these inspection windows, and if you take a look, you can see a green stripe. All right, so as long as you can see a green stripe in those windows, you know that the cargo door is latched. All right, negative pressure, relief doors, and all of the cargo doors, including the main. Right? So if the pressure outside the airplane was greater than the pressure inside, they would open up and it would equalize. All right. Uh, These in part. Question: Is there a possibility we see green on one and uh, red on the other? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. I would. I would say there is a possibility. They're all right? individual. So we have, we have and they all have to be green. They're yeah. All individual. Lines. Well, you know what? If you look in the MEL, it might say that you could have some number. Uh, red, like I don't know. I'm just yeah. going to guess one or two. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, but you'd have to look in the uh, MEL to, to see that for sure. Um, those doors on the 76 uh, actually come into play in flight if you lose both packs. So if you have a moment, look in the QRH, all right, and and uh, look for pack off, and then if it says if both packs are off, so I've lost both packs for whatever reason, all right, then it has you fly a, a specific speed, all right, and the reason it says you're going to fly a specific speed is for ventilation. So as the nose of the airplane goes through the air, it creates a bow wave. That bow wave comes back to the fuselage at that point if you fly specific speed. 
right? So if I'm unpressurized because I lost both packs, all right, then when that bow wave comes back, it's going to push those doors open and air can circulate through the airplane, right? So normally you don't think about them, you know, but they actually have a purpose in flight if we were to lose both packs. Huh. How, how often do we lose both packs? I've never heard of it. But it must have happened because it's in the QRH. Yeah. yeah. Those are the negative pressure release. Correct. Yeah. Negative. All right, so we're working our way back. Light. Good condition. <clears throat> Leading edge. Good condition. Right. Uh, bird strikes. Mod strikes. Who knows? Right. Could have some damage to it. So that's going to be good condition. And I have. I don't. I never really counted the number, but probably ten of these. Okay. So they should all be locked. All right, so it shows you a picture of what a locked one looks like, so you can draw a straight line across uh, the uh, fuel stick. So we don't forget. So number one, they should be locked and they shouldn't be leaking fuel. That's all you're really looking for. All right, what they are is if you have an indication problem with your fuel system, maintenance can deploy that, unlock it, pull it down, let go of it, and it floats to whatever the level of fuel is. There's a scale on it, and then they go in the chart and they can tell you how much fuel's in that tank. Okay? But lock, not leaking fuel is what you're looking for. Alright, so I'm just looking at the condition of the engine here. Alright, I don't see any fod or anything where it shouldn't be. The source of earth appear to be closed. Access doors should be secured. I'm going to look at the inlet. I have a couple of probes. They should look like they're in good condition. This is the only part of the engine that is anti-ice. This is cowl. All right? So the hot air, all right, would leave and, you know, some of it would be ingested. But this is the only thing that's directly heated. Just, just the lower cowl? Yeah. Say again? The whole, yeah, this whole cowl. Okay, got it. All right? So that's the only part of it, of the engine that is anti-ice. Oh, okay. All right? All right. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. You can stand up in there. I don't want to see a bunch of leaking stuff coming out of this engine. All right. So if I see a pool of oil or fuel or something, obviously I'm going to go get leaking. Right. Reversers closed. Access doors are secured. Access doors are secured. All right. Now I can look at the leading edge again. I can look at those fuel sticks. I can look at the flat tracks. All right, everything appears to be in good condition. All right, one, two, three. All right, so these three slat panels that have those little holes in them, that's the leading edge uh, that is anti-ice. The rest of the leading edge is not. So the oral question would be, um, what part of the wing is anti-ice and you will say the three most outboard slat panels all right so one two three that's it okay everything inboard of that does not get any heat all right okay the primary reason for that is i have <clears throat> i have an aileron right there uh -huh. and if i have a lot of ice build up it really affects the performance of that aileron all right, so I lose a lot of roll control. So that's why the three most outboard uh, are the ones that heat, because it keeps um, ice from blowing back and destroying the lip characteristics of that engine. All right, here's a fuel vent. More fuel sticks, they should be locked, not leaking. Here's a fuel vent that obviously should be clear, unobstructed. And then I have nav lights, collision, uh, collision lights, so I would probably have the position lights on for my creep lights. So oh, no, no. Check oh, those. I have four ailerons, right? Two outboard, two inboard ailerons on the 7.6. So I'm looking at that condition. I'm looking at the static uh, discharge uh, wicks. Um, where would I look to see how many of them I can have missing? <laughs> MEL. MEL. CDL. CDL. Okay. Oh, CDL. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Which is part uh, of the MEL. Yeah. All right. All right. What's that? What's fuel that down, pipe? Down, fuel down. Yeah. yeah, this airplane has fuel jettison. Not all of our 300s do, but most do. 
All right, so one on each wing. I jettison from the center tank only, okay? And uh, if the fuel jettison pumps are operating, it's like 2,600 pounds a minute. And uh, if they're not, then I'm just using the center pumps to jettison, and it's something less than that, probably around 1,500. So what's the point of that? To jettison fuel. To, to, weight, to right? lose weight. Uh, so dump fuel. Yeah. No. yeah, nobody. Does that. Well, almost nobody. I think it was Delta or somebody maybe a couple years ago took off out of LA. They had some problem. They started dumping fuel and they dumped fuel all over a bunch of kids on a school playground. Oh, yep. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. But um, almost the nobody the does city fuel great. because you can do an overweight takeoff and then you just have to do an inspection. Could have just went over the ocean and dumped it there. Overweight landing. What is? <laughs> this is a three. No 200 that I know of has fuel jettison. Oh, okay. Wait, is this our airplane? Uh, Turning edge of the wing, looking for good conditions of flash. That's the inboard aileron, so outboard and inboard. <laughs> to look at these wear pins. With the brakes applied, this pin would move in. If any part of this pin sticks above flush of this little indicator, like this one must have like brand freaking new brakes, okay? So any part of this is above flush, then the brakes are good. If you can't see this pin, because it's in here somewhere. No brakes right? there. And brakes are warm. You have got to point that out to me. All right, this is the... So, so this one, you, oh, there it is. Yep. Uh, so that is the... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Tilt. Tilt the actuator. All right, standard hydraulic system powers the gear normally. All right. Standard hydraulic pressure forces this in the air to be tilted, like that. The truck would be tilted, yep. Chrome is showing. I have two opportunities for them to slip a gear pin in on you while you're doing your free play. All right, the 7.5 only has one, but the 7.6 has two. The gear is so much bigger and heavier. All right, this is called a drag brace. Mm. Mm. Dang it. I'll think of it. Um, two braces, all right? And right here, and right here are the sensors to tell you that the gear is down in lock. Uh. Side brace, drag brace, side brace, all right? So um, if those sensors do Sorry. not sense Sorry. that this link is freight. If it's kinked a little bit, then there's going to be some air gap on that sensor, and you're not going to have a green light for that whatever gear. Okay? So between the spring pressure pulling it into position and hydraulic pressure, uh, then it should be down and locked. If I had to put the gear down alternately, no hydraulic pressure, then it's up to the springs to pull it into position. Okay? <coughs> So if you have a moment, look at the QRH for drag brace and side brace, right? Because you treat them differently. If this one doesn't indicate down and locked, you're going to increase your airspeed and all the air load against this big massive gear increases, all right? And hopefully it'll push it into the down and locked position. If it's this one, the side brace, it has you slow down all the way down to V-Rep, all right? take pressure off of it, hopefully the spring pressure can pull it into position, okay? So right underneath you guys is a area that's rat. red around it. That's where the rat is stowed, okay? okay? Everybody know what the rat is? No. Ram air, tur Ram air turbine. turbine. Anybody know what it provides? Hydraulic pressure. Hydraulic pressure only. Has nothing at all to do with electricity, like some airplanes. All right, so put that out of your mind. 
Center, primary, flight controls, that's it. Nothing else. Okay? Any questions about that? Oh, what makes it come out automatically? 50. Well, it drops below 50 or both engine goes out. Both, both engines, engines both out. Engines right? Out. So flame out of failure, both engines in flight. Yes. 80 arms it, 80 arms it, and 140 activates it. 130, 130 is the minimum speed. Okay? So if, all right, you're having a pretty bad day if that's your only source of hydraulic right. power. Okay? <laughs> I've lost two engine driven pumps, I don't have any AC power, and that's it? All right, well, don't go below 130 until you are safely on the ground. Okay? Got it? All right, so uh, go ahead. I'll just go inside with these guys. Um, they're, they're another access door, uh, another antenna. <laughs> should be good condition. This antenna 47. Cargo compartment. All right? So uh, the front one, notice how huge the door was? Yeah. So it actually will accept the cans. All right, just like the main cargo compartment will. This is where they would put uh, bulk. Bulk. bulk stuff, and then there's an actual bulk compartment on the other side that you see. When it was a passenger airplane, the bulk is where they would put the cats and dogs. All right. So this is bulk loaded. Here's a drain mask that should be clear and unobstructed. All right. Everything's in good condition. And I get to the uh, leading edge of the stabilizer, good condition, access door secured. This is your tail skid, powered by what system? Hydraulic. What system? That one? Hydraulic. Hydraulic. What system? I have three hydraulic ah, systems. Main. Center. Center. All right, same as the gear. All right, so when I put the gear down, that extends. When I put the gear up, that retracts. Okay? So if I had to alternately put the gear down because they didn't have any center, then that's not going to be in a proper position. I'm going to have to lighten the message for that. Okay? It's not going to be extended if I have to put the gear down alternately. Right. All right. Um, stabilizer, elevator, good condition. Access doors for the APU. All right. I got two swing doors and then another square door. That should all be um, secure. Walking along the uh, leading edge or that discharge width. All right. Elevator appears to be in good condition. Tailpipe for the APU is clear and unobstructed. Vertical stabilizer and rudder. Look how big that rudder is. It's enormous. Okay. So because it's so enormous, we have something called a. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we have something called a rudder ratio system. All right, it is basically a rudder limiter. All right, based on speed. So low speed, I have a lot of authority. High speed, it only moves a couple of degrees. All right. So if that system fails, all right, the QRH says avoid large abrupt rudder inputs above 160. All right, and I also have a crosswind limitation for landing, because if I only have this much deflection because that's where it failed then I would have a 50 knot cross limit. Alright? 15 knots. Alright, there's another drain mask huh. clear and unobstructed. Whoops. Clear and unobstructed. Alright, all those things should be clear. Elevators in good condition, stabilizers in good condition. If I went into the flight deck right now and looked at my trim, staff trim indicators, I would say it is very, very close to 2.0. Alright? So that's that one, two, three black marks. Alright, that middle one represents 2.0. Alright? So the reason I point that out is if you're doing your walk around after a crew change and it's down here somewhere, that means that FO did a very poor after landing flow. Okay? <laughs> So you can judge the quality of the crew that flew the airplane ahead of you based on that. All right. So Talk when you put it at 2.0 as, as prescribed in your flow, then that's where you should see it. All right. This is the outflow valve. On the ground during your pre-flight, it, it should look just like this. Okay. Wide open. If you find it other than that, you need to find out why. Okay. 
in auto on the ground it drives full open so if it's not either it's broken or it's in manual all right but it should be in auto uh, unless unless the auto uh, pressurization is ME or something so. but but even so it still should be wide open so you need to find out why go ahead no alpha valve is pressurization. Oh, okay. balance, balance, balance. So with it closed, then it would drive the cabin down. If I open it, it would raise the cabin. Okay? But as a safety feature, it should be wide open on the ground. Because I don't want to pressurize on the ground. Okay? Alright. So this is the bulk cargo compartment. Um, if I can reach that, which I can, uh, I would make that handle be stowed properly. Otherwise, I would probably have to have maintenance. All right. When it was a passenger airplane, that's where they kept the cats and dogs because I can make this uh, 20 degrees warmer than the other two. Okay. Is that a flow through to the other side? Say again? The other door? Yeah, um, usually when I worked for U.S. Airways, their 200s had like a firewall between that and the app. But I think maybe on the freighter conversion or something, maybe they removed that, or maybe it's an option. I'm not sure. All right, but um, yes, if I open that door, I can actually see into the aft. Can you see across to the other door? Is there another door right there? Well, the well the aft is like here, so I can look this way and see the aft. Usually, there's a cargo net that separates the two. What is that? Pilot shit. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Does anybody know what this is? It's the, uh, the pack. Uh, oh, pack exhaust. Exhaust. No. Really? Try again. Yeah, but where is it exhausting from? <laughs> That's from the... What? Who said... No. All right. That, to me, that's a pack. Right. Okay. No, All right. Is, uh, Center hydraulic system. Um, Gear, yeah. flaps, flaps, heavy, heavy loaded system. It takes a lot of pressure to move that gear. Uh, yeah. All right, I've got two puny electric pumps on the center system, and then I have an ADP, an air driven pump. So, high pressure bleed air spins a turbine. That turbine is connected to a hydraulic pump to help those two electric pumps, and that hot air, that hot bleed air, exits the airplane right there. Is that what that rim air turbine button is in the flight deck? No, that's this. Right. Okay. So it comes out automatically if I have dual engine failure, but I can put it out any other time. Okay. But the ADP is a big air driven hydraulic pump that augments the two little electric pumps on the center system. Okay. So the center system on the 7.5 just has those two pumps because there's nothing on the center system on the 7.5 except center flight control. All right. The heavy system on the 7.5 is the left system. That's where the gear and the flaps are on the 7.5. All right. Without the air driven pump, without the gear, it's too small pumps. It would move it, but it would be slow. Slow rate. Okay. Just the pump alone. Just the pumps alone. If you want positive rate gear up and the ADP didn't work, the gear would go up very slow. The flaps would go up very slow. But so they about, still they so still like work. Half speed, what about if this in the second segment? You comply with the it, pretty iffy. Right? So if you went positive rate, gear up, alright, and then I got a bunch of hydraulic lights because I had such a load on the system, alright? Me, because I was an engineer for 28 years, uh, I would go to the ADP and I would go to on instead of auto. So maybe it just failed to come on automatically. But it's not a memory item, right? Maybe it should be, but it's not. Okay. All right. Another drain mask, clear and unobstructed. <coughs> Same thing we saw on the other gear. All right. Drag brace, side brace. Two opportunities for them to slip pins in on you. Spring should be in good condition. I shouldn't see, I don't know, any contraband or, you know, something up in the wheel well. It's not like 
I'm going to have a ladder with me and I can really go in there and inspect it, okay? But uh, I shouldn't really see anything, a box of something or a package of animal? cocaine or something that ought not to be up there, okay? <laughs> Any questions about that? Yeah, is this uh, normal to leak about the cocaine? You see those yellow drops in here? Yeah, where would normal? that be coming from? <laughs> I think something up there is probably dripping and running down and then dripping down. So no, that's not normal, but when I call maintenance over there, right, that doesn't look too bad. He's probably gonna say something like, oh, that's within limits, right? That's their famous phrase, right? <laughs> but, but at least you did your part, all right? Uh, you know, if I have a puddle, okay, that's unacceptable, right? A few drips, and I don't know how long this airplane's been sitting here. Could be days, maybe even a week. All right, so I would say that this is a pretty small leak. Probably would be acceptable. All right, but get a hold of Mingums, make them make the call. Okay, all right, any questions about what we saw here? All right, then I'm going to go out the uh, trailing edge, leading edge, just like I did on the other side, until I come back to the engine. I'm going to check the same thing that I looked for on the other That's end. cool, huh? That brings me here. What is that? You want to take a stab? differential pressure there's a valve behind each of those doors that valve has a pin and when it opens to release the excess differential pressure that pin hits that door and it goes from this to this okay so the valve is free to open and close as much and as often as it needs to to keep the pressure within limits but one time that it hits that door, it's going to go like that. It's going to stay like that. So when you're walking around, you see one or both of those doors like this, then you know you had an overpressure event during your flight. Okay? So now we have to find out why. Was it me that caused it, or is there something wrong with the automatic controller? Yeah. Yeah, that has to be reset by me. All right. Once it goes like this, it stays like that. Okay? All right. So, I probably should have stopped this on the way through, all right? but the way I go around the airplane, I'm back there, all right? so I tend to always get it when I come back in from this way. This is the uh, inlet, inlet for the heat exchangers for the air no cycle. It's going to go through some heat, uh, heat exchangers and then the hot air is going to be exhausted here. These doors move. They open and close to regulate the temperature. So at 39,000 feet, they're probably only just a tiny bit open. All right. And then, of course, on the ground, on a day like this, it'd be wide open. Right. Okay. But cooling air comes in, those NAC events, and then the hot air exhausts uh, overboard out of these holes. Again, all these access doors should be clear and obstructed. Good condition. Main vent is clear and unobstructed. Another static port should be clear and unobstructed. Here's the main cargo door. Alright, it's not your responsibility to make sure that it's um, closed and locked. The loading crew and, and the load master and all that kind of stuff should do that. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> should do all of that, but that's the main part over there. So usually when you come out the airplane, there's going to be some kind of a loader parked in front of it, and they're running the cans uh, in and out of the uh, airplane. Another static port, clear and obstructed. And that is called a smoke override valve part of a uh, port equipment cooling system. This is the overboard exhaust valve, also part of the shipping plant. All right, so just a quick 
primer on the equipment cooling. Today, power up this airplane, this door is going to be open. Hot air and a lot of noise is Ooh. coming out. It could be pouring down rain and there would be a dry spot right underneath it. <laughs> Alright, there's so much air and so much heat coming off all your avionics equipment, and circuit breakers, your instrument panels, all that uh, stuff gets exhausted. Okay. On okay. a cold fall day, let's say, where the temperature is 45 degrees or less, this will be closed. Alright, it's cool enough that it can just recirculate the air and it's fine. But once the temperature goes above 45, then this opens. When I start both engines, alright, so today, when this opens, I start both engines, it's going to go close. I might be in Phoenix, and it's 120 degrees, that's going to go close. Mm -hmm. Alright? So, there's a chance, if you have a really long queue waiting to take off, that you could get uh, equipment overheat or something. Okay? But, normally you have enough time to get in the air, and the 300 has really good air conditioning. Usually you'll be okay, all right. But if, if you're at a 120 degree airport and you got a long line with both engines running, it'll be okay. Who knows? You might get an overheat. All right. The easy fix will be just shut down one engine, and this will open back up. Now the hot air is getting blown over. When I get close to getting ready to take off, I can restart that engine. It goes closed, and I take off, and everything's fine. Okay. Is the normal taxi with one or two? We taxi with two out, one in, okay. all right? But <clears throat> because it takes so much power to get the airplane uh, to move initially, and it would take tons of power with one engine. Passenger world, they single engine taxi all the time, all right? But, um, but we single engine taxi in, we don't single engine taxi out. Okay. Yeah. And during winter, Except you taxi with both engines every time? Say again. During winter. If you have a snow or something, you're taxiing in that. You use both engines all the time, right? You taxi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're taxiing in after landing, you mean? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, that would be. Done more control. Yeah, the that'd case. be kind of dumb if you're, you know, have icy uh, taxiways and stuff like that. Exactly. Uh, the normal operations, you taxi out two engines. Two engines out, one, one engine one. in. You have unless, life. unless the captain, yeah. you know, wants two in. Yeah. Right. So it's just a fuel savings. Uh, savings thing. Yeah. All right. Who was not here okay. when I was standing right here talking? Me? All right. Come and see me. 